House Bill 324, the clerk will read. Representative Singh, Bose, Yabura, and Torvik, House Bill 324, a bill to be entitled Ensuring Dignity and Non Discrimination in Schools. General Assembly, North Carolina, and Acts. The gentleman from Gaston, Representative Torbett, is recognized for motion. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to move that the House do now concur with the Senate uh, Committee substitute for House Bill 324. The gentleman has moved that the House concur with the Senate Committee substitute to House Bill 324, and the gentleman has the floor to debate the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, members of the House. First and foremost, I want to thank the many concerned parents, students, aunts, and uncles, grandparents, and teachers who have contacted me and you, their elected representatives, with concerns about what is being taught in our classrooms today. House Bill 324 demonstrates the General Assembly's intent that students, teachers, administrators, and other school employees recognize the equality and rights of all persons and provides a window for parents to see what their children are being taught. Additionally, it prevents discriminatory concepts from being taught as fact or endorsed in North Carolina school districts. This includes being taught that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex, or other related concepts that reduce individuals to simply their gender or skin color. To be clear, this bill does not change what history can and cannot be taught. No spin or innuendo changes that. I would encourage each of you, if you haven't, to simply read the bill. It simply prevents schools from endorsing discriminatory concepts. At the end of the day, we should all be able to agree that no student, no teacher, no parent, nor any school employee should ever be made to feel inferior solely because the color of their skin or their gender. This legislation goes far beyond the current debate over critical race theory and is written to prevent schools from endorsing any ideology that treats people in a prejudicial manner, both now and in our future. North Carolina must have an education system that unites our children, not divides them. An educational system that propels our children onto their path of achievement to reach their American dream. With that, I encourage support from the members of the House. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What purpose of the lady from Wake? Representative McGill rise. To speak to the bill. Lady has a four. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, when I looked at the bill, I thought, title sounds all right, but let me look further into the bill and see about the devils in the detail. I am a former classroom teacher. I taught for 23 years in the Wake County public school system. Teaching is a profession, and our teachers are professional. They are taught how to teach their subject matter. They have, they have taught that they must uh, always have respect from the class and from other uh, personnel in the school. They always have a command of their subject. And that is what teachers do. They teach their subject matter. You know, sometimes we talk about teachers as if they don't know what they're doing. And sometimes it w I wonder about the fact that, um, are we trying to throw the baby out with the water? I also want to tell you something that happened to me as a classroom teacher. My first year coming out of teaching, out of college, I taught at an integrated school. And I, and some of the students said I had an accent and that sometimes it was difficult for them to hear me. But I thought that I spoke well and I thought that most of the comments that I made were understood by all of my students. But I had a student 
who went home and told his parents, his or her, I won't say who it is, they might remember this, um, because they're still here in Wake County, that I was a bad teacher and that I spoke, I used God's name in vain and that I cursed in my classroom every day. I didn't know this, but when my principal came to tell me about it, you know, I wondered how in the world can someone think that I was using God's name in vain and profanity in a classroom of 30 students per hour and six classes a day? Because pretty much when you start out teaching, you get to teach the same subject matter for three to five hours a day. But I am, I get real excited when I'm teaching math and the students are learning. And to be honest with you, this person was a straight A student in my class. I said to myself, maybe this student is failing and he's saying that the reason why he or she is failing the class is because I'm not teaching the subject. But when the principal told me what the child had gone home and told their parents and that the parents wanted me fired from the school, I was shocked. I usually tell students when they're doing well, and I believe instant uh, praise of students is better than waiting until they put it on a paper and pass it in to you and you pass it back to them. So I had a saying, you got that right. And I don't know how many of you might are, are able to put that together in a phrase that may have understood, or you may have understood it to be using God's name in vain or cursing. You got that right. And I guess it depends on how fast you say it. But that was the phrase that the young lady was talking about. You know, if the principal did not think that I was doing my job in a professional way, then that principal might have fired me without even telling me what was going on. But that principal had observed me several times and was very pleased with what I was doing in the classroom. So I'm saying to you, that sometimes we think teachers are not doing what they're saying or doing right by all students. Teachers really, really want our students to get the best education possible. In a math class, have I had questions asked of me about race? Yes. I was in the civil rights demonstration back in the 60s. I've had students to talk to me either during class, and I'll have to say, we're in a math class, I have to get back to my math subject. But I would tell them to see me after class, I'll talk to them about it. But anyway, the fact that they wanted to, somebody had told them that I participated in the civil rights movement was interesting to them, and they wanted to know just exactly what I did. Now, I wanna know, is a conversation like that something we wanna ban, because that child, that asked that question really wanted to know about the civil rights movement and what part I played in it. So I think we need to be very careful that when we set policy, that it's good policy, and the policy is to help our teachers teach our kids the best that they can and make, our, and, and make all of our kids successful. So I think we should not be establishing policies such as the one we're getting ready to vote on. And I certainly hope that you will not concur with it. Thank you. Uh, for what purpose does the gentleman from Mecklenburg, Representative Lofton, rise? To debate the bill. The gentleman has four. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the most powerful experiences of my life was when I attended a family reunion in Northumberland County, Virginia, 
where my family was enslaved. My grandmother's grandmother, Sarah Lewis, was in her 20s at the time of emancipation. The very first thing my family did at the end of slavery was build a church. The second thing they did was to build a school. In fact, that family reunion was held at the site of that very school. So if you can picture it, there I am, a young lawyer, returning to the land of where my great-great-grandmother and her family were slaves and where they built a life for themselves after emancipation. Of course, as we know, that life wasn't easy. After the Civil War, Virginia passed some of the nation's first and strictest black codes. These laws restricted the right to vote. They enforced segregation. They imposed forced labor on black children through, quote, apprenticeships programs. And they even banned black Virginians, like my family, from owning firearms during a time of rampant Ku Klux Klan violence. This is the history that shaped my family story. I rise today as an elected representative and a lawyer, but most importantly as their son. I have to speak out against this bill. This bill, while innocuous sounding enough, encourages us to look away from our history, to look away from the truth. It even goes so far as to encourage, quote, impartial, the word impartial meaning neutral, detached, and disinterested teaching of slavery, segregation, and racial oppression like that which my family suffered under Virginia's black codes. Neutral, detached, and disinterested. You know, my first job out of law school was working for the legendary civil rights lawyer, Julius Chambers. That's the job that brought me home to North Carolina. As you know, Julius Chambers helped integrate public schools all across our nation by successfully arguing Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg schools before the United States Supreme Court. It's one of the great victories and contributions of our state to the great civil rights movement. He did so despite the threats against his life. He did so despite the bombing of his office, the bombing of his car, and the bombing of his home. Working for Julius Chambers and learning from him was the, one of the greatest honors of my life. When I think about Julius Chambers, when I think about my family, when I think about the Greensboro Four, or the countless men, women, and children, black and white, from all over this nation who marched and protested and sat in and risked everything to give life to the self-evident truth that all are created equal. I don't feel shame. I don't feel guilt. I feel gratitude. I feel inspired. I feel responsible. We live in the greatest nation in the history of the world. It was not made so by accident. It was not made so overnight. It was made the greatest nation in the history of the world because Americans, black and white, young and old, who were willing to be uncomfortable, who were willing to look squarely at the truth and see the possible, see the greatness in this nation. How can we now turn away from that legacy? How can we now turn away from our responsibility our responsibility to the truth, our responsibility to their legacy, and our responsibility to this great nation. Please vote no. For what purpose, the gentleman from Nash, Representative Galliard, rise? To debate the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen of the House, I rise today to voice my no vote to House Bill 324. Our nation relies on a well-informed, a well-educated electorate. Our teachers and our parents are tasked with cultivating young minds, young minds that are inquisitive, young minds that are balanced 
because they've been exposed to a broad range of ideas and concepts. I didn't always know this, but since I've been in the General Assembly, I've learned that all of our legislation when passed has either has consequences and sometimes unintended consequences. As I read, read section one, subsection C of the bill that lists all the concepts that should not be taught. And in doing so, what it does is that it makes this legislation, whether intended or not, legislation that is about censorship and about book banning. This bill has a near fixation on references to race, racism, sex, oppression. If you just read the words of the bill. And I got to asking myself, how would then this legislation play out in a high school English, in a high school English class? If this became law, teachers could no longer teach Great Gatsby because there would be too much discussion about class, about status, about wealth. We could never again teach the Scarlet Letter because of its themes about religion and gender roles and the flaws in our society. We couldn't teach the last Mohican because of its attention on colonialism and prejudice. There would be no more reading of Gone with the Wind because of a focus on white privilege, a focus on slavery, a focus on plantations, or to kill a mockingbird because of its themes on race and class and inequality and prejudice. The bill before us robs young people. It robs young minds. It robs young people from learning that injustices can be turned into justice. It robs them from understanding that in the world there are heroes and there are villains. It robs them from knowing that in every story there are antagonists and protagonists. I'm the father of three wonderful daughters. It robs young girls because now girls are gonna be censored from the classroom discussion about strong, smart, and courageous women like Lizzie Bennett in Pride and Prejudice or Melba Beals in Warriors Don't Cry. Any bill that references race or sex 29 times in one subsection and as an attempt to pass a law censoring the discussion of race in the classroom only confirms that racism is indeed embedded in our laws and in our institutions. Our public school classrooms should be a marketplace of ideas. We should be encouraging an open and robust exchange of thoughts and perspectives. This legislation will prohibit a teacher from responding to a basic question from a student on why people are protesting or to answer the question why black people are more likely to be killed by the police. This or any attempt to legislate a colorblind curriculum in the classroom when the society of our students they are living in is far from colorblind is in its own way, its own form of miseducation. At a time when our teachers and our parents need every tool available, this bill censors what they can teach and this bill provides no pathway to consider the way our history is taught. The good and the bad should be taught faithfully, and this includes the oppression of millions of people. This is America. This is North Carolina. Censorship happens in North Korea, China, Saudi Arabia, but not here. In 1787, the night before the Constitutional Convention, this is what Benjamin Franklin wrote. It is absolutely necessary that knowledge of every kind be disseminated. Any education policy that comes from this General Assembly floor should begin with Leandro and not censorship. I would ask you to vote no on this legislation. For what purpose does the Lady from Durham, Representative Mori, rise. To speak on the bill. Lady has the floor. And just to follow up with my colleague, Representative Galliard's statement, if you just look at the bill, the title of the bill 
in section 1A. Let's leave it there. Let's vote on that. An act to demonstrate that we will not discriminate, that we will foster and defend intellectual honesty, freedom of inquiry and instruction, freedom of speech, association. Let's end it there, and it's a great bill. The problem with this, the body of the bill defies what the title of the bill talks about. Because as you go into this bill, section C, we have 13 prohibitions. You shall not teach this. 13 areas do not teach. But then I am most concerned when you get over to the next section on page two and we talk about what must be posted on the website. And it must be posted 30 days before any instruction is made on any of the 13 prohibitions. So current events, something happens, you have to post it, wait 30 days, see if there are objections before you can teach it. Can we even debate or teach students the debate on this very bill? Because I think many on our side of the aisle says it is censorship, it is racist in and of itself in this language. It is stopping the teaching of concepts. Can I teach, can I go into a classroom and talk about the governor's racial equity task force, which is based in fact, which is based in racism? Probably not, have to post it on the website. Can I talk about where jury trials, because they've excluded all black jurors, unconstitutionally and being overturned. Can I talk about those decisions? Can we teach about Dred Scott? That's the problem with this bill. Not only the 13 areas of prohibition, but if you dare have a racial equity person come in to teach a class, you must post it 30 days before they can come in. What are we doing? Teaching belongs in the hands of the educators not censorship by the General Assembly. And it can't help but be said, look at our sides of the aisle. And I assure you, every member on our side of the aisle, a member of color, will vote against this bill, and we should take their lead. Thank you. For what purpose, gentleman from Caldwell, Representative Hall, rise. Debate the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, members, this is not my bill, and I didn't intend to speak on it today, but from time to time, I think what happens here is we hear a debate about a bill that's not in front of us, and that's what's taking place today. Much of the criticism that I've heard today is about a bill that's just simply not before this body today. We've heard a claim that this would somehow prevent teachers from teaching about the civil rights movement. And yet, if you actually read the text of the bill, it makes it clear that teachers can't compel students to believe, among other things, that an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. That's, that's the very essence of the civil rights movement, that we don't treat others differently based upon their race. That's what this bill prohibits. It says that a teacher can't compel a student to believe that. We've heard that this bill somehow would prohibit certain books from being taught. It would be a, a book ban. Except the problem with that claim is the language of the bill makes it very clear that teachers can't compel students to do certain things, to believe certain things. Not that they can't teach about racism. This has nothing to do with that at all. We all know racism has existed and still does. This bill doesn't prohibit the teaching of that. No, this bill says that a teacher can't compel a student to believe that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. I wonder if, if one opponent of this bill would rise and say that they believe that a teacher should be able to compel a student to believe that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Well, will one person who's against the bill rise and stand and say 
I think that a, that a teacher should be able to compel that. That's what this bill prohibits. It prohibits a teacher from compelling a student to believe that an individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. It says that a teacher can't compel a student to believe that an individual should be discriminated against to receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her sex. It says a teacher can't compel a student to, to believe that an individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. And I could go on, but I won't, because I, I think the, the, the point is made. Frankly, I don't believe anybody in this body believes that these things should be compelled to be believed by any student in our system because they're abhorrent beliefs. And I know that the opponents of this bill, they don't believe that's what should be taught in schools. But the opponents are debating a bill that is not in front of this body today. This is a bill about preventing teachers from teaching students and making students believe, compelling them to believe or prof even profess a belief that one race or sex is inherently superior to another race or sex. Who can disagree with that? In 2021, who believes that that's what should be taught in schools? That's what this bill prohibits. It stops in this state. It has nothing to do with a lot of the other claims that we've heard today. Read the language, focus on the language of the bill and, and not the national debate surrounding this issue. Let's talk about what this bill would do because it's very clear and it's very simple. I hope you'll support this bill. For what purpose, the gentleman from Wake, Representative Jones Rice? Speak to the bill. The gentleman has a four. When I look at bills in this assembly, I try to read most of them, and I've managed to accomplish that in the nine months I've been here. And I always ask myself, what is this bill about, and where did it come from? And I ask my L.A., I say, uh, who are the sponsors? Sometimes the sponsors' names are on there, sometimes they aren't. So when I heard about 324 um, and I read the title, uh, I went to the starting point. It started over in the Senate, I think. Well, maybe it started in the House. I'm not sure. But I went over to the Senate to, to hear the debate just the other day. I heard Senator Berger speak on it. I went to Senator Berger's press conference before he spoke on it. I listened to Senator Woodard speak on it. And um, I asked myself, why is this here? Who's out doing any of the 13 things that are prohibited? Who in the world but a Nazi or a Klansman would even teach this stuff, 1 through 13. If you read through the list, I mean, it's crazy stuff. I, can ima I can't imagine a teacher in the state of North Carolina and my mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, ex-wife, all teachers. I can imagine a single teacher standing up and teaching somebody that one race or sex is inherently superior to another. That an individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist. That an individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his race or sex. On and on. Who is doing this? Where are you getting this information? It's a boogeyman. And I'd like to see a film or a picture of somebody actually standing in front of a group of students in North Carolina in a classroom and teaching what's in those 13 uh, parts. In fact, the truth of it is, if the bill stopped there, I probably would have to vote for it. 
Really would. Because that is abhorrent. If it's happening. But as I read the bill, I got a little better feel for it when I got to the second page and you get into the nitty gritty of it, which is subpart D of section one. It says public school units shall notify, shall notify, I mean it's mandatory, the Department of Public Instruction and make general information available on the public schools units website with detailed information available upon request at least 30 days prior to any of the following. And it goes into a list that ties back into the first section, the 13 parts. Now, if somebody were really doing that, understand the reason for the rule. But we have local school boards in this uh, state, Gaston County, Wake County, Mecklenburg County, any county you name. And they have the power and authority to stop anybody who is off the beaten path. It doesn't have to be done from here. Because the local people will take care of their local business. So what's the need for us to mandatorily put this mechanism in place where now the local people, some person in X county has reported to the big boys in SDPI up in Raleigh before they can put forward a curriculum. Seems like too much control from this building. Something that used to be, when I was starting out as a young man, I'm 69 now, but when I first got into politics, and was studying the Republican Party, used to stand for the principle that the government closest to the people is the best government. Closest to the people is the school board. That's what they do. And if somebody is threatened by something going on in their county, they can take care of business right in that county. They don't need us. They got the power, the law is already there, and they can take care of it in any county in the state. So what's the purpose of this bill? The purpose of this bill, I believe, reading through the lines, is that somebody up in here wants to control what's going on in a county where they ain't gonna come from. They think there's a need for Big Raleigh to pass laws about this. When if you object to something in your county, you have a way of taking care of it right now. Now, a couple other things. It seems to me when you talk about American history, and I majored in American history, 1789 to the present, there's a lot of controversial stuff in history. And it's, uh, it grates a little bit. If you have to get into the nitty gritty, some of it's shocking. When I was a little boy, my mother read me a book called The Negro in Virginia. That's because my daddy was from Virginia. And it went into the history of slavery from 1619 when they first brought Africans to this continent all the way to the present. Back then it was in the 70s. Now the book's been updated. She read it to us because she wanted her children to know the history. Some parts of it made me cry, broke my heart, hurt my little eight-year-old mind and soul that they did that to my ancestors. But she read it to me anyway. It hurt. But she wanted me to know because she wanted her son to be prepared to go out into the real world and deal with it. And it helped me. So she was smart to do it. Now, we need our children to know the history of our country. They didn't have anything to do with it. They weren't even here. But they need to know. If somebody thinks it's too egregious, too harsh. No, they can handle it. They can handle a lot more than we think. 
but they need to know because history is prologue. That's what's on the awning of the National Archives. And that's what it means. I think about um, a line from Julius Caesar when uh, Mark Anthony was speaking to the crowd and talking about Caesar's accomplishments and how they killed him and how people should go out and fight that. And then there's a little line in Shakespeare's uh, play where he says, after Anthony stirs the crowd up, he says, mischief thou art afoot, take whatever course thou wilt. And I suggest that if we start delving into dictating and reviewing what people are teaching in classrooms from the SDPI, because somebody is upset in whatever county, that's going to be mischief thou art afoot. Take whatever course thou wilt, because boy, oh boy, we will be inviting it from here. I suggest that Wake County and other counties can take care of their own business. They don't need any guidance from up here. They have representatives on school boards elected by the people, just like we elected by the people. To do that job specifically, they hire a superintendent of education to do that job specifically. He works at the will of the people in the respective county where he or she serves. So we don't need this bill, but this bill opens up a whole lot of unknown territory. And I've been a judge, for, I was a judge for 17 years. You'd be surprised how law can be used. I mean, God knows, and you put this bill in the hand of some resourceful lawyers, whew, I hate to think what we'll be getting mushrooming litigation because somebody departed from what they think this bill meant. We don't need to go down this road. It's handleable. It's being handled, taken care of right in the local arena. So I don't know who pushed this through to get it to here, but I would say to any of them, those people, go back home Talk to your local school board members. If it's something being taught in your schools you don't like, they can take care of business. They don't need us. So this bill is fraught with mischief. And if we vote it through, and it doesn't get stopped somehow before it becomes law, that line from Julius Caesar will begin to apply mischief Thou art of foot. Take whatever course thou wilt. Thank you. Members, uh, just uh, we're, we're going to allow the debate to keep going. Um, and certainly appreciate the, uh, the, the na nature and the thoughtful nature of this debate, but would advise the members we do have two other bills that we do intend to add to today's calendar as well. So, uh, with that, for what purpose, the lady from Pitt, Representative Smith Rice. I would like to ask the bill sponsor a question. Representative Torbett, does the gentleman yield to a question from Representative Smith? Certainly. He yields. Thank you. Um, is it a true statement that the Constitution of the United States, one of the country's founding documents, was exclusively signed by 39 white land-owning men? Is it yes or no? Uh, I honestly don't know how many men signed the Constitution. Okay. It was 39. Um, I have a follow-up question. Uh, if the gentleman wishes to yield, the lady's recognized to ask a series of questions. Certainly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Is it also true that the United States Constitution, which those 39 white land-owning men signed, explicitly excluded women, minorities, indigenous Americans, and individuals who did not own land? From doing what? When you said exclude them, when you say from doing what? For, for being a part of this um, founding document and this, this Constitution. I will try to understand what you're asking with, without having been there, of course, and not read thoroughly what happened in the room when they were signing that document. Uh, 
I'm not certain who was participating or not. I do know women did not have the vote then. I mean, Republicans gave women the vote just 100 years ago. So I understand that part. So I'm going to assume that no woman was active in it. Uh, okay. I, that, that, that's well, about say without having lived that experience. Okay, well, that, that answers it. Thank you. Um, I would like to debate the bill. Yes, yeah, for debate the bill. So we can agree that yes to both of these two statements are true. This country's constitution was signed exclusively by 39 white land-owning men who explicitly denied the same rights they gave themselves to women, minorities, indig indigenous Americans, and individuals who did not own land. Now, there's a problem here. According to this legislation, HB 324, if I were a teacher and if I taught these two facts in my classroom, I could be in violation of part eight of subsection C of this bill, which states that teachers cannot teach that quote, the United States was created by members of a particular race or sex for the purpose of oppressing members of another race or sex. Now, perhaps we could have a debate about whether or not I did just violate that bill, but the more important point I wanna make here is this bill is indeed a slippery slope. Yet, I stand here re-emphasizing the point I made back in May, the very first time we debated this bill. Whose truth is the truth? And who gets to decide that? This bill is so incredibly dangerous, but on top of that, it's also incredibly insulting. It's incredibly insulting for roughly 100 members of this legislative body to think that they know better about what should be taught in our schools than the 100,000 public school teachers who have made it their life's profession as teachers. My colleagues love talking about making decisions local and about getting big government out of our everyday life. <laughs> well, Nothing screams big government like a purely partisan process dictating every facet of education down to what we can and cannot teach from history. I find this bill to be insulting to so many. A majority of this room seems to be under the impression that if we teach kids about racism or the racist history of this country, this will somehow automatically create a generation of racists. It is insulting to think that our kids cannot handle the truth. I'll be honest, this bill scares me, not only because of how insulting and degrading it is to teachers, to parents, and to students, but it also because of the fact that it leaves so many doors wide open. So many questions about this bill remain unanswered. Who is in charge of enforcing this bill? Will DPI have a special unit that goes from school to school on a witch hunt trying to trap teachers? Will there be an investigative unit looking into the teachers accused of teaching things that's banned in this bill? What happens to those teachers whose lessons are disputed? Are those teachers given a warning, multiple warnings? Are they suspended without pay? Are they fired? Can they ever teach again in public schools? Where does this end? Will we come back to a session next year where, with more suggested items to even add to this list? I really do believe that most people in this room understand that this bill serves no other purpose than to agitate people and to push us farther apart on cultural issues. There are so many real challenges facing so many real people in our state right now. This is not one of them. Every minute this legislative body has wasted focusing on this legislation was a minute we can never get back, which we now can never use to actually improve the state, our state in a way that would matter or make a difference in the lives of parents, teachers, and students. I ask my colleagues, please remember the reason why you're sitting in this room right now, to serve the people of North Carolina. Again, to serve the people of North Carolina, all people of North Carolina.
And I hope you think seriously about whether or not a dangerous, insulting, and open-ended piece of legislation like this is truly the best way to serve all of the constituents that you're tasked with serving. I urge you to please vote no on this legislation. If we don't learn from history, let's just make sure we remember, it's bound to repeat itself. Thank you. For what purpose does the gentleman from Robinson, Representative Graham, rise? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, to speak on the bill. The gentleman has the floor. Thank you, uh, members. Uh, I stand to speak in opposition of this bill as the only American, Native American, American Indian, however you want to recognize us. It goes against my culture, it goes against our history. And because of that, I feel it's my obligation to say I will not support this. While we can agree that our teachers deserve, our, our students deserve a quality, fair, and unbiased education, this bill is rooted and going in the wrong direction. This bill threatens to limit the ability of our teachers to teach our true history of our state and nation, both the good and the bad, and we have both. We all agree to that, the good and bad. The reality is, there are dark parts of our history, just as there are brilliant triumphs of our history. This bill limits, threatens to limit the ability of our North Carolina teachers to teach about the atrocities that Native communities across this country suffered. As the member of the first people, you know that history. But the sad part about the history that you know is that you were taught that my people were bad people. Therefore, they were slaughtered. When they were standing up to defend their communities, their livelihoods, their food, they were slaughtered. They were protecting their land. As a result of that, they were slaughtered. Good. I, got, I cannot stand here today and allow my heritage and my history to be further erased. I, I can't support that. The truth of the matter, this bill is based on fear-mongering, but it's the communities like mine that will pay the price. The true history will never be known. This bill is a return to the previous inaccurate teachings of my communities, where we ignore the harsh reality that millions of Native people died from disease, war and mistreatment. Is this we want our children to understand about my culture? I was told, taught as a young child that we were savages. Not only that, TVs the movies depicted us as savages, bad people. You don't want to be around that Indian over there. He's a bad man. He might scalp you. He might hurt you. He might bring harm to you. There's a reason that many of our native communities remain impoverished even after centuries of hard work to get ahead. It's important that our children understand our history, not just my history, but African-American history, Hispanic history, Jewish history, the parts and the vital roles they played in the, the development of this country. I cannot stand 
uh, here for this to be erased today or any day as long as I'm serving in this body. I think it's my obligation to stand up for my people and speak truth. And that's what I'm speaking today. I'm speaking truth. I think our children need to know the truth. Children who are unborn need to know the truth. And the facts. Just the facts. Nothing more. What's wrong with that? I do fully attend to vote against this bill. You vote your conscience. We will vote our conscience. We will vote our feeling based on fact. And I thank you, Mr. Speaker. For purpose, further discussion, further debate? If not, the question for the House is the motion concur of the Senate Committee substitute to House Bill 324. Those in favor will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will open the vote. Representative Brisson, Representative Arp, just off the floor. Chair will give it just a moment for those gentlemen to. Representative, oh, Representative, uh, Representative Richardson here. Okay. The clerk will lock the machine and record the vote. 60, having voted in the affirmative, 41 in the negative. The House does concur with the Senate Committee substitute to House Bill 324. Bill is ordered enrolled and sent to the governor by a special messenger. Representative McNeil is recognized and forth a conference report.